All right. I started to say good morning <laughs> out of pure habit, but good evening. How's everybody doing? Everybody's left. <laughs> a bunch of kids went back. Um, before I get started with my message, just a quick reminder, uh, this coming month, the month of January, if you've been around for DCF for a while, you know that that's the, the month that we go after uh, grace teams. And so um, if you've not been a part of DCF um, and you've been a part of another church, you've probably heard those uh, types of teams called ministry teams or service teams, those different kinds of things. But the reason why we call them grace teams is very specific. We try not to do anything arbitrary at our church because uh, I don't think God does that, so we try not to do it as well. Um, but the reason why we call them grace teams is the Bible talks about grace gifts that are, that are given to all of us. Um, the Father, we, we, we talk about when we teach into this, that the Father gives gifts called grace gifts. Jesus gives the five-fold ministry gifts. Ephesians 4 says um, when Jesus ascended from on high, he gave gifts to men. That's the five-fold ministry gifts. And then the manifestation gifts from the Spirit. You read about those in 1 Corinthians 12, um, various places all over the New Testament. So for that reason, what we do is we teach into how God designed you, how he made you. Um, and so much of what we are is because God made us to be that. Uh, I talk about all the time when I was little, my uh, aunt, we were on a trip with my mom and my aunt, and I was talking, go figure, <laughs> and she just simply said, does, does he ever shut up? And my mom's like, no, never, he never, he never stops talking. Now, um, that was tainted with the fact that I was unredeemed, <laughs> so hopefully as I grow and become more mature, I learn how to stop talking enough to at least listen to some people. My wife can attest that I've gotten a little bit better at that in the 30-something years we've been married. But, uh, but that gift was put inside of me. He made me to do that. Um, I wanted to become an architect because I love to build things. And, uh, and it's interesting that I discovered in my journey as, as a believer that my desire to be a, an architect in the natural was because God had designed me to be an architect in the spirit. And once I discovered that and discovered my purpose, I stopped chasing after who God made me to be in this world alone and chased after it eternally. Um, and when I did that, the, the, I just can't even begin to tell you the satisfaction, the, the sense of being, the sense of wholeness, the sense of fulfillment, the sense of dreaming such a big dream, because it wasn't tied to something that was temporary, it was tied to something eternal. It's part of the reason why we do grace teams is because everybody is like that. God made you. When, you know, you've heard this statement, God don't make junk. Well, when he made you, the Bible says, and in, in, you know, it talks about making mankind on the sixth day, everything he made up until then was good. Anybody know what he said when he made mankind? Very good. <laughs> and so when he made you, he had something in mind. Now, when we're outside of Christ, that's unredeemed. We talk about this with kids a lot. If, if you have a kid that's, um, that's stubborn, that's just the beautiful gift of tenacity that God wanted to give your child, only it's unredeemed and they need Jesus, right? Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but when you have that and you point that in the right direction, it's an amazing thing. When it's pointed at you, it's a bit dangerous. But you get that thing pointed away from you and away from their own selfishness. And just watch what God can do through a person who is submitted to him and knows who they are in Christ. And so that's what we do about around grace teams. And so uh, as we gear that up, be ready. January 15th, we're going to do a big rally day. That's where we uh, open the door for all the teams and say, this is, who, this is who we are. This is what team, you know, production team back there, the worship team up here, kids church team. There are a bunch of different teams, some teams you can't see, the finance team. So whatever God's gifted you and graced you with, as we go into this, Part of what we want to do, the reason we do that is to help you discover who God made you to be and then begin to release that purpose and that destiny inside of you in, into the service, into the life of other people, which is how God designed us to do it. But what's amazing is what happens to you when you begin to do that. So we're excited about that. So that'll be coming this month. So get ready for that. So now I want to um, preach a message called Seeing the Promised Land. Um, I messed with a bunch of different titles about what this could be. The best is yet to come. Uh, vision. I mean, you know, you knew what was coming. It's not like I was going, <laughs> I wasn't going to preach something like this on this day, right? Um, but I, I settled on seeing the promised land because there's some scriptures that I want to read uh, where Israel is, they're, they're right on the edge of the promised land. They've landed this, in this place called uh, Kadesh Barnea, and it's just this, it's almost like this oasis. It's a beautiful place, but it overlooks, as it were, um, the promised land, the thing that God had promised them to give. So let me just kind of give a bit of a setting as we kind of get into this, um, and this will help us kind of understand. So I, I put a picture. I've got a picture up here. I'm, I don't know if you can see it that well, but it's a, it's a kid's church picture of, uh, of the promised land. 
And so the reason why I use that is because when you do the adult version of it, there's about a million things on there that's not, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. In the kids' church, it just keeps it simple. And so the, the picture is um, the children of Israel had left, the, the book of Exodus, as they left Egypt, and we know all these stories, the stories of the Ten Commandments, if you've ever seen the movie, and they go on this journey um, down through the wilderness of uh, sin, Mount Sinai, and at Mount Sinai, they end up there for about a year. Most people don't know this, but there's a, they're there for a year, and this is the time frame where God is uh, giving them the Ten Commandments. It actually it turns out there's a whole lot more commandments, and so um, they're, they're just basically getting ready for what God's going to do with them. And so the book of Deuteronomy, which is what I'm going to be reading out of, is, uh, it gets its name uh, from a word that means second law. And it doesn't mean that there's, there's necessarily a new Ten Commandments. It's not what it means. Um, it's basically Moses is, they're getting ready to go into the promised land, and now Moses is preaching a series of sermons to the, to, to the people of Israel and reminding them of the promises of God and the laws of God and the reason why God made them different because he's giving them a land where that's going to matter in a really, really big way. And so now they end up, and I'm going to start my message from the passage where they end up at this, on the precipice of this promised land. And so um, the picture, if you think about it, the picture is they've come now, you know, the, the journey is 11 days from e- Egypt to Gadesh Barnea. So it's an 11-day journey. They walk this, and they're there, and they're ready to go into the promised land. Some of you guys kind of know the spoiler that's coming. <laughs> they don't actually go in right away. But it's an 11-day journey that turns into a 40-year sojourn. Anybody ever felt like that? <laughs> it's like, you know, Lord, you promised me something so huge. And then next thing I know, like I'm walking out around the wilderness. And, and the whole idea behind this is they get to this place, and God has promised them over and over. He's promised since, since Genesis with uh, Abraham and, and the whole story of Abraham and his sons and all of the things that God has said. They go away into captivity in Egypt for more than 400 years. All the time, the promises of God are there. They're crying out, God, what about the promises? What about the promises? So you think you have some challenges and, you know, challenging God on the promise. These guys were serious about the promises because they kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. And because of their disobedience, often they would, they would take their, themselves and remove themselves from the promises. So now they're on the precipice of the promised land. And they get the big idea to say, you know what, we don't know what's in there, even though God had already told them what's in there. So we're going to do some things our way. You see how this is already going to get them in trouble. And so they decide to, to pick 12 guys, send them into the land, see what's up, and then come back and tell them what they found. So here's, here's the problem with that right off the bat, okay? The promise had been coming, the promises, 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 promises. God's saying, this is a land I have given you. This is yours by, by the promise that I, I don't change and, and my promises don't change it's yours. And so there's, it's a land of milk and honey. You know, he just goes through all these beautiful promises of what this land is going to look like. They're coming from captivity. They're going to have to learn what it feels like to walk in freedom. They've never done that. The generation that landed at Kadesh Barnea had never walked in freedom. They'd always been in bondage. So this was the first time, right? So they get Mount Sinai, they get the law, they're getting ready to go into this beautiful land of promise, and so they send in the spies, and we know the story, 12 spies come back, they come back with the fruit of the land, which was massive, the grapes were, they, they said the bunches of grapes were so big they had to carry them with two men, you know, on a pole between them, um, the land of milk and honey, all the promises God said was there, but there were also giants, <gasps> Right, <laughs> and so so the other so that was ten guys, and the other two said, "Yeah, but the, you know the giants are nothing to God." And the ten up the ten spies said, "Yeah, but we are nothing to the giants." And so you can imagine just this argument on the way back from you know seeing what they saw. Ten of them are going, but the giants are so, we're like locusts, we're like bugs in front of these giants, and you know J- Joshua and Caleb both saying, "Yeah, that's true." Right? It's not that those things aren't true about the promises of God, that the challenges look bigger than we, we thought. They're definitely bigger than us. Right? He said, but God is bigger than the giants. And so some of this is, as we get started, it's helpful to see the perspective of the promises God bring you don't come without challenges because we live in a fallen and a broken world. And they don't come without an enemy, a giant, that comes against you to keep you from walking into the promise. Now, the giant really doesn't care about you. The devil really doesn't care about getting you or having you on his side. He's so selfish, he could care less. 
all he wants to do is to do damage to God. He can't hurt God because God's way bigger than him. It's not this yin and yang thing that I learned in the martial arts and Eastern mysticism. It's actually God is the creator and everything else is the created, including the devil. So the only way the enemy can harm God is to harm you because you are his beloved. And the Bible says that you, in Psalms, are created a little lower than the angels. So there's God the creator, right? There's the created angelic beings that are powerful. And we've seen that when angels appear, people would fall on their face before these angels, right? So they were massively powerful and fearful. Or, or they would induce fear in man. They would fall on their face. And then the Bible says, and God created man a little lower than those angels because even the devils were angels at one point, right? And so... The picture then is, the scripture goes on, it says, but he has crowned you with majesty from on high. So in our unredeemed state, the devil, he he has a field day in our lives. He does. And he can even have a field day in our lives as believers if we don't recognize that we have been crowned with majesty from on high. So there are giants in the land, there's no doubt. When David sees the giant, he tries on Saul's armor, it doesn't fit. There's just so many stories about how God's promises are on the other side of the giants, on the other side of the challenges. And David steps out into the field to fight the giant. He throws a rock and hits the giant in the forehead. So he had some skill. There was something about him being created a little lower than the angels, but he prayed and asked God for accuracy and power and asked that God would be in this. And when he let loose the stone and the, and the giant fell, David went from being a teenage boy to soon becoming the king of all of Israel. So the promise that God had placed on this young man was on the other side of that giant. So that's what I want to start with this, pers- this perspective. And now let me just read you some of this scripture, and I'll make a few comments and we'll be, be out of here. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. It says, the Lord our God said to us at Horeb, that was that place, you know, as they were coming away from, uh, from Egypt, he said, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Remember, they'd, they'd arrived at Mount Sinai. The law had been given. It, they'd spent a year there. Uh, there were some challenges. Uh, the, he come down from the mountain, broke the law because they were building a calf out of gold. Everybody's crying, wanting to go back to England. It was just a mess, right? So it's typical local church stuff. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. So he says, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in uh, Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev, and along the coast to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river Euphrates. So he's telling them about the boundaries of the promised land, right? He says, See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. So he's, they're, they're poised on the edge of the promise. Does that make sense? And so then skip down to verse 19, Deuteronomy 19. It says, So we departed from Horeb, and we went through all that great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the mountains of the Amorites as the Lord our God had commanded us. So they were obedient up to this point. It says, then we came to Gadesh Barnea, and I said to you, this is Moses, you have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. So he's pointing this land out. And he says, go up and possess it as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. So let me start with this concept. Um, for many of us, it's just time to move on. <laughs> Whatever mountain you've been at, you've been there long enough. And it's just time for you to move on. Some of that could be challenges with relationships that you've been dealing with this whole year of 2022. Maybe for years, maybe decades, you've got things in your life that you have been camped out at this mountain trying to hear from God about something. God has talked to you about some promises, and you have never left the mountain. And I feel like one of the things God wanted me to say to us is it is time for us to leave the mountain. It's time just simply to move on. It's what he said in verse 6. You have stayed long enough at this mountain. So so often we discover this in, in, in ministry. When we're talking to people, I hear the regret, and I hear the pain, and I hear the sorrow, and I hear the brokenness. And what I hear is you're still at the mountain. And it's everything inside of me to challenge them and go, listen, lay that down. Quit your complaining. Quit your whining. Put your big boy pants on or girl pants, whatever it is, and, and get your butt moving. Why? Because the complaining and the, all, and the whining and all the stuff that we do, and listen, I, you're not, I'm not exempt. I do it too. But there's a moment where God comes to us and says, are you done? 
It's time to move away from this mountain, move into the thing that I have promised you. Really, in essence, he's, God is saying to us, are, are you ready to grow up and take this on? Are you ready, you know, to put it in masculine context, which is, you know, what I, I think about sometimes is, are you ready to be a man about this? Are you going to keep complaining and being a little boy, right? Um, we have friends who are from Africa, and uh, they tell the story that there's a very interesting tribe that's near South Africa, that when the children come of age, there's this, uh, this uh, rite that they do. And so the elders and, and, the, and the, you know, the religious people of the, the adults, uh, uh, men of the tribe, they gather in, in one big group, and they walk from house to house or hut to hut, and they step out and they look out at the hut, and they say to them, they're saying to the young man, come out from among them, son of my people. That's the phrase that they use. And what happens is mom comes out and any little boys come out behind her because dad is in this group, right? And so he's now he's saying, you have your tight little family, but now it's time to come out from that tight little family and the protection hiding behind your mama's apron and come out into masculinity, into the promise of manhood, into the promise of who God made you to protect and cover, not just your own family, but also this tribe in this region, this area, right? And, and what happens inevitably is Every, it doesn't matter how old the little boy is, at some point he realizes that the call is there and he has to deal with his fear to either stay behind his mama's apron or step out from there, walk that distance, and come into the company of men. And it's a little bit terrifying because that's a, mama's a safe place. I don't know if you know that in the South. <laughs> it's the safest place there is unless you make her mad, and then it's the most dangerous place to be, right? But so, so they have to decide, and if they choose not to come out from among them, son of my people, they stay another year. And it's the price you pay as a little boy who's fearful, who hasn't gotten his courage yet to step into the company of men. And there's a reason why they do it, and it's powerful. Because when those little boys step out, they never go back. They're not even tempted. Maybe they're tempted, but they never go back. Never go back to that place because they've had time to think at, about it and they, they're given a year gap each time. And when they're ready, they step out from among them. And in, in a sense, this is what God's saying to us. It's time to step out from some of the safety that you had. Listen, some of the safety is your, it's the, the big future God's given you, the promise or the new job or a relationship or getting past your pain and your heartache. Some of it is my pain and my heartache has defined me to the point where if God healed me, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. And that's a frightening place. And I mean physical healing, psychological healing, emotional healing. We, sometimes we have developed our identity in something that's still stuck at the mountain, and the promise is way over here, and we haven't even left the mountain yet. So it's time to step out. So stop giving time and energy to the past, something that cannot be changed anyway. And the good news is in grace, that's been forgiven it's been wiped away. It's been washed away. Jesus says, I take your sins and I put them in the sea of forgetfulness, never to remember them anymore. As far as the east is from the west, I'll take your sins from you. It's a powerful thing God says. Deuteronomy 1.7, he says, break, camp, and advance. So let me say it this way. You have to make the time to make the move. You don't take, I'm going to take time this year and start ex exercising. No, you're not, you liar talking to me, <laughs> right? You know, you know what you got to do? If you keep saying that with words, one, stop it. You're just driving yourself crazy too and everybody around you. I mean, the joke, I always, sometimes I do it on January 1st, how, you know, how full the gyms are, right? <laughs> how many of you guys bought a gym membership and didn't go one time? Anybody? Okay, just me. All right, so here's the thing. If you don't make time to make the move, this is what he said. He said, God said to these people, you have to break camp. <laughs> now, that's basically saying you need to leave your house. Remember Abraham? Leave everything you know. Go into a land that I'll show you. Where is it, Lord? Here, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> I need you to leave here. Yeah, but where am I going? You're, I'm, you're not listening. I'm not telling you that yet. I'll tell you along the way. You'll, you'll get it. Do you trust me? Yes, Lord, I absolutely trust you. Then break camp and leave. Where are we going? That's just me, right? So here's the second part of this picture is we can do that because God's promises are true. 
Deuteronomy 1.8 says, he said, see, I have given you this land. This goes later on into Joshua after this has all been accomplished. And listen to what they said in Joshua. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it. Now, not this time. Remember the spoiler alert? They're standing on the precipice. The, the, the uh, spies come back, and the spies, you know, 10 of them say one thing, two of them say the right thing. And the whole people got, you know, they, they got torn away from the promises of God because they, they wanted to believe the lies, right? They wanted, listen, God had been talking to them about these promises the whole time. When we look at this, sometimes we go, well, God, you just don't understand. They're poor little things. You know, they just, please stop doing that. <laughs> don't do that. When God, when God brings judgment or God brings a consequence to bear on somebody's life, I promise you we have deserved that, Okay? God never punishes. God never brings consequence in the old covenant. He never does that without some truth being violated that God had to deal, deal with sometimes in drastic and powerful measures. And so people like, I don't believe in a God who will send people to hell. Well, first of all, God sends no one to hell. You go there of your own accord. And you go there because you don't want anything to do with God. That's just the point of it. So what the Bible says, when you preach the good news, people will cho still choose not to come into the good news. The people that stood before these, these spies, two of them had the right, they, all, all they were doing was just saying what God had all, already been saying the entire time. They weren't bringing any new information. The giants in the land, yes, there are giants in the land, but God, you know, Caleb said it too, he, I, I am well able, able to take this mountain, and later on we find out that after 40 years where everybody except Joshua and Caleb from that generation dies, those two guys go into the promised land. So Joshua's telling the story. He says, they took possession of it and settled there. Not the guys I'm talking about. <laughs> They're kids, <laughs> 40 years later, right? So they, they, the original group said, we're going to be disobedient. We're not going to go. And so again, this is the old covenant. So the, the punishment and the consequence for these people, it, it's not, I mean, when we look at it, we think it's severe. But the Bible said they just wandered around in the wilderness. Now listen, I've been in northern Saudi Arabia, and it is wilderness. It's not what I thought wilderness was. There were no trees, hardly anywhere, only near the oasis. And, and that was what Kadesh Barnea was. That was the place that they camped and kept coming back to for that 40 years that they were in the desert. Here's, I don't have it written down here, but there's another place in the Bible says, when they were out there, they disobeyed God, and the punishment was they were gonna wander around, and they were gonna die in the wilderness and never see the promised land. And that seems harsh. It wasn't because they were disobedient. They brought it on themselves. It was the old covenant before Jesus. Thank God we're not there anymore. But even in the old covenant, God's grace was there because the Bible said that when he did that, their clothes never wore out, their shoes never wore out. They had magic shoes and magic clothes, <laughs> right? They were taken care of in every way, but they just never stepped into the promises that God had for them in that world. And so I just want to take a moment here and say this to us. We're in the new covenant, thank God. The punishment, the Bible says, that was due us was placed on Jesus, all of it. God has no more wrath for you. If you want to stay in your sin, you, 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 you bring the wrath of God upon your sin because you choose to keep it and own it yourself when you could give your, your sin away to Jesus because, he, in fact, he's already done everything. He's taken it. He's taken the punishment for it, but unless you choose to take the punishment for it yourself. How many know if, if someone pays off your house and you keep making payments, stupid is as stupid does, as a great philosopher from Alabama once said, Right? So, so that's the picture of what Jesus did for us. But we can still live in foolishness and sin. We, even as believers, we can refuse to step into the promises. We can let fear, let the lies of the enemy keep us from going where God has said we can go and he's made the way already. But understand this, even in, even in the old covenant, before the new covenant, before the grace that Jesus, that Jesus brought us, his kindness and his grace was still poured out to that people. And if you refuse to go in, God's goodness is still for you. He still loves you. That's not going to go away. You're not going to hell. None of those things are true. There's a bunch of preachers who'll preach that because they, they want you to quit sinning. Sinning just means you're missing the mark. Don't you think it's about time that we as a church stop talking about missing the mark and start talking about what the mark actually is, right? And so the mark is God's intention for you is, is good in every way. 
His promises are true. We know this is, this, he, his, the whole idea is there is a promised land. There is an inheritance for you that you didn't deserve, but it's yours anyway. But there's something that you have to do, and we're going to get to that in just a second. But listen to the rest of this. He says, they took possession of it and settled there. In verse 44, the Lord gave them rest on every side. That's another one of the huge promises of God. Just, he is, just as he had sworn to their ancestors throughout that time, not one of their enemies withstood them. Not one of their enemies withstood them. It's a promise that God said, if you go in, I will make sure that your enemies fall by your hand. And he's tricky. And hopefully you'll, we'll figure this out as we go. It says, the Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. And listen to this, this is verse 45. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one of them was fulfilled. This is the promise that God has for you. You think it's good for them, the promises God had for them, to dwell in a land of milk and honey, right? <laughs> to dwell in a land that was, I've been to Israel. It's unbelievable. The, the variety, the vastness of, 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 from being in the ocean to being in the mountains, it's just incredible. We, we were there for nine days and drove over the entire country. Maybe not the best way to see a country, but we saw a big, big part of it. And it was just, I can't even begin to tell you, Right? And, and this, the Bible says it's not one of their, these promises did God renege on, not one. And that was the old covenant. In the new covenant, the promises are even greater. So, so do you believe that God's promises to you? Hebrews 3.18 says an interesting thing about this original group of people who are supposed to go in. He says, and to whom did God swear that, he would never, that they would never enter his rest, which was the promised land, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. It did not say they were not able to enter because God was mad at them or wouldn't let them or any of those things. It said because of their own unbelief, they were unable to enter. It did not say they couldn't come in because the giants were just a little bit too big. Not one time. So here's what you need to understand as we move forward. If you're going to fulfill, if you're going to walk into the inheritance that the Lord has for you in your life in this world, you're going to have to obey him. You're going to have to walk into obedience. You're going to have to say, you know what? The circumstances are giants, and they're big, and they're, they're showing themselves strong. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but be of good courage. That's what he told Joshua. Be of good courage. Take courage. Why? Because I'm bigger than them, and I got your back. And at some point, we've seen God enough times. Again, the promise, part of the reason why there was such judgment that came on the children of, of, of Israel not going into the promised land. Even Moses couldn't go into the promised land. Why? Because God told him, I want you to speak to the rock, and he struck it. What's really interesting, there was another time when he, has, when he actually asked him to strike the rock. But this time, and so you think this small thing, this small act of disobedience kept Moses from going in. Yes, but why? Because Moses was a representative. He was in authority, and he was a representative of who God was. And he was disobedient because God had shown them his anger. That's part of what the law was. You, you break the law, you get the consequences, right? And so, so he, he'd shown them that with them striking the rock and water came out that God was providing for them, even though they were disobedient and they were, they were arrogant and they were all those horrible things. God was still doing it, but he was a little bit mad, <laughs> right? That's part of the consequences. But then he was showing them about his grace, his promise of what was coming. And he said, speak to the rock, and the rock will provide. In other words, communicate with the one who provides everything that you need in a way, not angrily, not going, God, I deserve this, or God, you ought to, or God, none of those things. Not shaking our fist at God, but recognizing he's a father who not only is willing, but longing to give us good things. And because Moses violated that and painted the wrong picture of who God was, he couldn't go in. So their own unbelief, choosing not, unbelief is not, I don't know, um, you know, <laughs> I didn't get up enough inf information. That is not what unbelief is. Very clear in Scripture. It's choosing not to believe. That's what it is. It's letting fear rise up. It's letting the lies and the doubts and all those things. It's not having those. It's not those things come. They come to everybody, right? They even came to Jesus. Jesus Three times in the garden, Lord, if this cup can pass from me, it's not, that he, it's not that he didn't know the plan. He was just, he felt the emotion. He felt the physical, literally to his body was bleeding, great drops of blood. He was feeling the fullness of the temptation to say no to the plan of God, and he said yes anyway. And he modeled that before us. So it's not unbelief because I didn't know. It's unbelief because I've chosen not to know or I don't want to know. 
So here's the thing. As, as we stand on the precipice, there are things that you're, you have to make a decision that you're going to believe God for as you go into this new year and the next and the next. And you have a limited time on this earth. I do too. I think about that more as I get older. When I was 20, it never came up, <laughs> right? Unless you went to a funeral, then it came up, and then I would forget about it. But the older you get, the more you realize, okay, there is an end to this time frame, this, this temporal place. And so I have something God has asked me to be on mission. The promised land was the promised land because God is the God of the promise. It wasn't just milk and honey. That's awesome. I love milk and honey. God had no problem giving, milk, giving his people good things. He has no problem giving you and I good things. But it's not good things just so we can be indulged as, you know, as, as challenging brat children. He's given us these great promises because these promises don't just come to us, they come through us. And we're gonna see this before we finish this message. So here's the thing, God's grace creates the promise. Do you see this? It's his, good, it's his goodness that does this. James 1.17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and listen to where it comes from, and it comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. He is good all the time, all the time he's good right? My wife shares this in various ways. They're doing it back there with the kids right now. We're te- Why do we teach this? Because it's true. So you read a- another place, 2 Corinthians 1.19. It's very interesting. It says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silas, and Timothy, was not yes and no. So when he preached the gospel of Jesus, he wasn't, he wasn't saying God is yes and no. Listen to what he said. But in him, in Jesus, it has always been yes. God is a God of yes. <laughs> I love it. He goes on and says, this is Numbers 23, 19. It says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Uh, one of the greatest revelations I ever had in my life as a believer was when I discovered that I wasn't God. Right? The scripture, Psalms 100 says, you're the sheep of his pasture. It is he who made you and not you yourself. Why would God tell us that? Because we buy into that lie. We get into this independence thing, and, and the enemy comes, and he says, did God really say, do you really need God? You can do this. You can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. No, you can't. Not even John Wayne could do that. Right? You, you just can't. So this, this is just the way it works, though. He says, does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? It's a good question. So let me, let me say this about his promises. Do not let temporary circumstances rob you of permanent promises. Don't do that. The temporary circumstances that come up will lie to you and go, see, God's not good. I have had the ability for 30-something years of serving Jesus to, to, to have the gift of being able to look backwards and go, wow. At times, I felt like, Lord, I went down this road, and that seemed like a total train wreck. Lord, I, even in my disobedience, I went here, and I look back, and it's like, the, it's like a squiggly line all over the place. I'm like, well, but when I look backwards, I see the plan of God in every bit of that. Even my disobedience, he rescued me out of it. Even my foolishness, he rescues me out of it. When I turn to the Lord, the Bible says, something about that, his goodness and his kindness, he can't help himself, he draws me back in, right? Don't let temporary circumstances rob you of permanent promises, but here's the thing I want to get, get to you today, and I, I need to define it carefully because we're not in that old covenant like those guys that we're, we were preaching about earlier. We're in a new one. It's an old covenant, an old way. New covenant, a new way. But here's what you need to understand. Our obedience is what secures the promises of God. I did not say our obedience is what causes God to love me or save me. <laughs> That's not what I said. I said our obedience secures the promises of God. So the part that you and I play in securing the promise. Look at Deuteronomy 1.8 again. Go in and take possession. Here's the land I've given you. Now you go get it. Right? I, I remember my dad, uh, I remember helping him take out the trash. Helping. <laughs> we, we burned back, you know, we were poor. So we burned our trash in a big uh, 55-gallon drum that he brought from work, Right? And so we'd carry it out there, and sometimes it was cold, some Birmingham, so it wasn't real cold, but sometimes it was cold, and, and I, would, I would help him. Was what, what that really meant is I was touching whatever heavy thing he was carrying while we took it to the trash. My dad didn't need my help. You know what my dad wanted? My dad wanted me to be with him. That's what he wanted. Now, I grew up eventually and became able to carry that trash myself. 
And then, you know, now I invite Reese. I don't have any kids, so I invite my little puppy to come along with me. And she loves taking out the trash with me. She doesn't help at all. As a matter of fact, I have to go chase her down afterwards. But I love the fact that she wants to come out there and be with me. And God's the same way. Uh, Deuteronomy 1.8, the rest of that says, Take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to your fathers. Wait, Lord, did you give it to me or do I have to go get it? Yes. See? See how it works? Deuteronomy 1.19, a little bit further down, he says, As the Lord our God had commanded us. In other words, he said, the key to this is I've made it available. This is my mission. You didn't come up with the promised land. You didn't come up with the idea of a promised land. I did that. Everything about the goodness that you experience in the world was my idea. God's like, I'm good, and because of that, I want to, I want to be good in you. I want to be good to you. I'm, I'm the one who's good, but I've commanded you, if you're going to walk in this goodness, you can't do it your way. You can't make your own rules. You can't do it your way, like Elvis and all the other people who died not having ever gotten what they really wanted, right? You have to do it his way. Just, here's some scriptures. Deuteronomy 5.33. 533, follow all the directions of the Lord your God has given you. Life will go well for you. God blesses those who obey him, Proverbs 16. He saves those who obey him, Psalm 7. The Lord watches over those who obey him, Psalm 33. The Lord takes care of those who obey him. God gives us what we ask for because we obey God's command, 1 John 3.22. Always obey the Lord and you will be happy. This is the good news translation in Proverbs 28. Keep God's laws and you will live long and prosper. That's the Spock scripture, if you ever want. <laughs> That's Proverbs 9. It doesn't say the prosper part. I made that up. Those who obey him have all they need. Those who obey the Lord lack nothing that is good. That's Psalm 34. But here's the thing. Two things are true at the same time. He has given us these promises, and he is giving us these promises. It's Deuteronomy 120. You have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving you. Not there yet, but it's yours. The very next verse. Look, the Lord your God has, past tense, set the land before you. Now here's your job. Go up and possess it. There's something that we have to do if we're going to possess the promises. So as I close, just understand, God's grace creates your promises, but your obedience to him and his word and his calling and his character and his nature and who he is, that's why it's so important to learn about him. That's what releases the promises into your life. That's, it causes you to go in and secure the promise that God has for you. So here's some profound questions to which God says yes, is these great promises that he's given us. Lord, do you love me? Yes, Am I forgiven? Yes. Am I secure in your love? Yes. Is there purpose for my life? Absolutely yes. Is there life beyond the grave? Yes. And it's with me. To all of these questions, God answers an everlasting and profound yes. He is yes. He is a yes God. So first, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians. I read some of this earlier. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silas, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him, in Jesus, it has always been yes. Now listen to verse 20, because this is going to cinch the deal for us. For no matter how many promises God has made, he has made you so many promises. Not just you personally, but all of the people who came before you. All the promises that God gave those people. His character, his nature is in all of those promises. The testimonies we heard today, right? All of those are promises, prophetic promises that God's character and his nature, he will do that for you if he did that for me. He's no respecter of persons. He's not doing it because I'm better than you. He's doing it because he's better than all of us. Right? And he loves us and he wants to pour out his goodness and his kindness. So no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. There is no other place where all the promises come to rest in us but in Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you are not going to see all the promises of God come to your life. Especially everlasting life. But listen to this. And so through him, through Jesus, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God God's not fickle he is not fickle he will fulfill his promises to you and to me he is not fickle he is not a man that he would lie but listen to this again 
all of God's promises, no matter how many they've been made to you, the promises that have come to you personally and the ones that you inherit through, through just being a believer, through being a person that God, you know, part of the, the humanity all the way from Adam all the way through, what Adam lost, Jesus restored in the garden. What Adam lost in the garden, Jesus restored. And it says, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, it has to be through him, the amen is spoken by us. So what does that, what does that mean? It means this. That at some point, every promise that God has made in your life, sometimes we say, God, I haven't seen this promise come to pass. And if you're honest, it's a promise that God says, if you'll do this, I'll do that. So he said to the Israelites, it's a conditional promise. Not every promise from the Lord is conditional. There are tons of promises that are completely unconditional. His love, his kindness, his grace in our lives, completely unconditional. That's why even when the people wouldn't go, into Israel, wouldn't go into the promised land, the Israelites wouldn't go in, their shoes and their clothes never wore out, and they never had to worry about their food. God took care of them. His grace was upon them even in their disobedience. So hear that. But hear this too. They never saw the promises in this world. And I think so often in the kingdom, we have people who cry about the fact, I'm trying, I'm trying not to be harsh, <laughs> and I hope you're not hearing that. I hope you're hearing that the challenge is that sometimes we cry and we whine and we complain, and God is faithful and kind, just like when we were little kids and we did this as parents. I don't want to go to school. <laughs> my dad figured out that fighting with me was, turn the light on wasn't enough, I'd pull the covers over my head. So in the wintertime, his, his position was he would just come in, he wouldn't say a word to me, he would grab the blankets, and he would just drag them into the living room. And I would lay there as long as I could <laughs> until the cold and the, and the circumstances I was in drove me to get my sorry butt up and walk into the living room where he had fixed me a cup of coffee and breakfast. And that's the kindness of the Lord. The Lord's like, look, circumstances many of these, we have brought on ourselves as humanity. The choices we've made since the moment Adam said no to God, that we now grew up and at some point in our own life also said no to God, and we were disobedient. And nation after nation over years and decades and eventually even eons, and the decisions we've made, the fight that goes on in the Middle East right now is because Abraham thousands of year, years ago did not believe God's promise and went and tried to help and God wouldn't bless it. So now there's a, there's a war going on that started thousands of years ago from a single act of disobedience. Now, think about those people who said no to God. Forty years goes by before a new generation comes in. Forty years. What if you were born that week? <laughs> you suffer now not seeing the promise for 40 years because of your parents' disobedience? What if you're born 20 years into the journey in the wilderness because your parents were just 20 more years you have to live in the wilderness, steal the grace and the kindness of God, but not seeing the promises? Why? Because of the dis disobedience of an entire people group. So it's not, it's not that it's not complicated, but here's, it always comes back to none of that matters because God's yes is not in whether my people group did a good job, whether, you know, whether, whether my nation did, whether my parents did or their parents before them, or even whether I did. Because it comes back and it says, thank God. The promise that comes to you is no longer now about your obedience or disobedience initially. It's about what Jesus did. And the promise is yes in him. However, you still have to say the amen. So what does that mean? It simply means this. Faith is not something I build up or I, I, you know, I, try, to, I try to grow and, and give back to God. Faith is simply, do I believe that God said something and it's true? And all faith is, is me acting on it. All I'm saying is, because I'm saying yes to God, I'm actually believing that he is true. All your words mean nothing. That's why so many people, false converts in the modern church, run rampant. Because so many people said, you know, they give words to Jesus, you know. I'm, of course, I, I asked Jesus to forgive me. I never let him come in and take over my life. I never gave him actually my heart. I've never submitted lordship to him. I've never done any of those things. I just want, the, I just want a ticket to heaven. I don't want to go to hell, right? 
So what, what, what happens is when Jesus comes, he says, look, all you have to do is say yes. You have to say the amen. I can do everything for you, and I have, just like my dad taking the trash out, asking me to help. I didn't help at all. I, I touched it, maybe, put my hand on it as, as if I were lifting it. Never did. But what I learned through that, that act of obedience of being with him is, one, I love my dad, Right? And also there was a mission that we were on to do something beneficial for a family. And again, this idea, it pales in comparison to what God's talking to us about. Why? Because the mission that God's called us on, part of the mission of these people to go into that promised land, it wasn't just so they could have milk and honey. It wasn't just so they could have ease. They had to fight often. They had to fight to, to gain the possession of that land. They had to push out evil people who had done horrible, evil, terrible things. That's why God had taken the land from them and given, them, given it to Israel. But they had to fight. They had to march around the walls of Jericho. They didn't fight the way they thought they were going to fight. They had to fight the way God called them to fight. And so how, how you get there, how you walk into the promises is recognize Jesus has done all the work, all of it. All you have to do is say the amen because Jesus is already the yes. You don't even have to say the yes. You have to believe there is a yes and act on it. How do you get saved? I place my trust in the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sin I could never pay for. You know how I know? I tried to live in the law. I tried to do it right. I tried to do the right thing. I could never do it. I could never do it. That the law taught me. I could not save myself. And then Jesus presents the gospel. And he says, I paid the price for you. It is finished on the cross. All the work is done. All of your sin has been taken, past, present, and future. All of the sin of all of the world has been paid for. All of the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus on that day, and then he died, signifying that the sacrifice was greater than the need even. And when, he, when that happened, the Bible says, Jesus said, it is finished, and then he gave up his life. No man could take it from him. He did. He was in control the whole time. And then he took all of that and said, would you like a gift? You, you, would you like a gift of righteousness? And the way that you get that gift is that believe, you have to believe that Jesus did that and all the implications thereof. Is he really God? Is he the Lord? Did he rise from the dead? Because if he didn't, Paul said to the Christians who came after him, if, we, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we of all people are the most to be pitied. But if he did raise from the dead, then the whole world is in darkness and we're the ones walking in light. So as, as we pray tonight, what I hope you didn't hear was that you need a whooping. <laughs> I hope that's not what you heard tonight. <laughs> what I hope you heard is you, you can get a whipping if you want, but you don't have to have one. Somebody took your whipping for you, right? <laughs> but there are promises that God has given you. And, and some of us, the circumstances, the enemy's brought everything he can. He's brought all the giants against us, and we're in the fight to secure that promised land. Well done. Well done. You're in that battle, and you're going after it, and you're going after it strong. But if we're honest, some of us, we've heard the lies from the other spies that the giants are too big, that there's no way I can make more money, there's no way I could be generous, there's no way I could serve, there's no way I could have a relationship, there's no way, and the list goes on and on. Everybody's got their challenges, right? The giants are different for all of us. Some of them are the same. So I just want to challenge you. Make a decision. You can, you can fight the giants yourself and lose, and you will. Or you can submit to the yes that Jesus has given and then just say amen to it. So now when you stand up against a giant of fear and say, Lord, I don't know what to do, but you do. The fear, the fear comes and says you're going to lose your job in this economy. What's going to happen if you get sick? Nobody's going to take care of you. And the list goes on and on and on and on. But God. But God. So all you have to do now is say, Lord, as I, as I think about the promises that you've made for me, what does the amen look like? Because here's the thing. To a child, I thought I was taking out the trash. I wasn't. <laughs> right? And I had to learn some things in that process of what it actually looked like to be on that mission and to eventually walk in the inheritance that was mine because of my dad, because of my father. And I think the same thing is, is true for all of us. 
There's an inheritance. Truth, all of us in Jesus, of course, salvation and his peace and his rest and his mercy and his kindness, are all, that's all true. But there is an inheritance that God wants you to take. And it's, it's a promised land that's not just full of milk and honey for you, although that is true. But the Bible puts it this way. Because we have been reconciled, because we have the milk and honey, because we have the rest, and because we have the peace, because we have hope, because we have all those promises that are yes and amen in Christ. And we said yes and amen to those, right? We said the amen to it. But those promises, because I've been reconciled, the Bible says, now go and be a minister, a servant of reconciliation. Because you have the good life, because you have all these things, look around you at all the people who are lost and undone and broken. And God's promise to these people in that time was that they would become a nation where people would see the justice and the kindness and the goodness of God, that God would take care of them in their obedience, their love for him. He would love them and he would be among them as a real true God, not just a demon or not just a, you know, a, an idol, but the real God would be in their midst. And when strangers would come into the land, they would want to be a part of the people of Israel and they could come in. It's the same promise that God has given us. As we go into this new year, the promises that God has given us is to restore the foundations of mission, to go in and to reach people who don't know Jesus. They are not the enemy. They're just as lost and as broken as all of us were. And if we don't make friends with people who don't know Jesus, we're never going to be able to share the gospel with them. That means it's going to be a little bit rough, right? It's going to be tough sometimes to build relationship with people who don't have the same value system Dear God, they might even be Democrats. I don't know. It, it's, there's no telling who God might send in your midst. Somebody in here is a Democrat going, it could be a Republican. Pray for me, right? <laughs> but here's the thing. At some point, you win the battle for you so that you can fight the battle for others. So tonight, let's win that battle for ourselves. We don't have to fight it. Jesus has done all that for us. But we do have to say the, the yes or say the amen because Jesus has said the yes. But what does that amen look like in your life personally? So as I pray, would you think about that? What do you need to say amen to? The promises of God in your life to settle some things for you, to bring you into that place of, of, of strength and wholeness and a vital walk with Jesus, connected with him all the time. When the fear rises up, Jesus presses it down because you know his word and you know his character and you know his strength. And when you need help, he's a very present help in time of need. That's the God that he promises to be. So whatever that is for you that you need to say amen to, would you just think about that for a second as we pray? So Jesus, as we come to you, Lord, tonight, um, Karen asked us to write down some things, Lord, what we're believing you for as we go into this year. Lord, some of those are deeply personal. Some of those are uh, big picture for our family or for our church or for our city, for our nation even, Lord. Um, peace on earth, Lord, literally, something as big as that. Some of them are just really, really specific about sickness or brokenness or fear, Lord, or being alone. Jesus, whatever that is, the enemy wants to lie to us and tell us that you're not good and you aren't willing to give us the things that you've promised us. Lord, we just want to acknowledge tonight that you are good, that the enemy has lied about who you are. He's lied about your character and your nature. And Lord, we will not submit to that any longer, Lord, we see the promised land that's been made available, Lord, by you. We see the goodness, Lord. There's some people saying one thing, and then there are some who are saying the right thing, and we want to listen to that. And Lord, at some point, we just want to take action in the next step of seeing this promise fulfilled in my life. Because as those promises are fulfilled in me, Lord, they begin to be fulfilled in the lives around me because your, your, your goodness doesn't just come to me. It comes through me. And so, Lord, tonight we trust you that as we say that amen, Lord, the things we've written down, they would become testimonies of your goodness and your kindness. Lord, that we would see tremendous growth in our own body here, uh, healing. We would see salvations, Lord. We would see needs met financially. But also, Lord, we would see people who are broken and undone without you come to know Jesus for the first time because of who we are as a church. And for that, Lord, we say yes and amen in your name. Amen. If you need prayer tonight, we'd love to pray with you up here at the front. Otherwise, have a wonderful, wonderful evening. If you've got kids, you can go back through those doors, and I think they'll probably be close to done by now. Love you guys, and see you next Sunday.